Okay, so this will be the review for uh, exam four. Um, exam four will be on chapter 16, 17, 21, 22, 23, and I'm adding 24, okay? I know it's a lot of chapters, but uh, there will be no free response question. So you probably are happy to hear that, okay? So there, it's all going to be multiple choice. You'll have 50 multiple choice questions and you have an hour and a half to complete those, uh, those questions, okay? So 16, 17, 21, 22, 23, and 24. That being said, I'm gonna upload a quiz, uh, quiz seven before the exam gets uploaded. Um, so I recommend you taking that before and that, that uh, quiz seven will be on chapter 16 and 17. So kind of giving you a hint, the majority of the exam will be on chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24, which are gonna be the body systems, the immune system, right, nutrition. And we'll cover, we'll go over a little bit of uh, what will probably be on the exam, okay? What, what major themes I want you to know. Um, so this will be kind of like your study guide for, for when you prepare for the exam. So I'll upload it late tonight. So you have Friday and Saturday to complete that exam uh, four. Um, and again, it'll be heavy on those uh, body systems, okay? So I know 16 and 17 are kind of uh, a little more evolution and a little more um, uh, development, uh, historical developments in biology, but um, chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24, we're going to be those uh, major body systems that we're covering, okay? So 24 is the, uh, the immune system, an overview of the immune system, okay? So hopefully the free uh, multiple choice uh, only test will help you out a little bit with that exam. I know some, some people struggle, struggle with the free response. So uh, made it a little easier because I added the extra chapter, okay? Uh, let's get started then. All right, so evolution of plants. So that was chapter 16. So again, I'm gonna have this covered on the quiz seven. So you're gonna get maybe a couple questions on the exam, but I wouldn't focus too much uh, on studying here. Um, if you're gonna, if you need to study something, I would recommend studying the majority of uh, 21 through 24. Okay, that's the majority of what I'm going to cover. We kind of talked about plants a little bit before with uh, photosynthesis. So um, there's going to be just a couple of, of little facts that I do want you to know, okay? Um, you should understand the basic structure of plants, right? Uh, vascular versus non-vascular plants, right? We talked about that already. Um, um, like mosses versus angiosperms or hymnosperms, right? The development of that has already been covered. So for the most part, we're going to be talking about the, the, the structure of plants, what types of plants that we typically see now, right? We typically see a lot of angiosperms in a flower. We have uh, stamen and styles, uh, stomata that open up to for gas exchange. We have a stem here. Uh, roots, they're used for absorption. We talked a little bit about nitrogen fixing uh, root systems, uh, which you don't really need to know about, but just the general uh, uh, structure of plants, okay? If I ask you to identify certain cells in a plant, you, you should be able to identify that, okay? Um, lignin, um, these, are, these are easy and quick to identify, so you shouldn't have any issues <clears throat> being able to identify that, right? We talked about xylem and phloem, okay? Where xylem is water, phloem is gonna be transporting sugars and other liquids throughout the plant, okay? The green color is the photosynthetic cells or the tissue, okay? Um, let me see. So we talked about chlorophytes, closest, al uh, closest uh, algal relatives to plants, right? These are green algae. They do have, um, these are considered non-vascular plants though, okay? So we talked about uh, uh, bryophytes as well that are non-vascular plants. So this was kind of the main uh, uh, start of uh, land plants, right? We talked about bryophytes lacking xylem and phloem. So this is a vascular tissue that we were talking about. This is moss, um, the mosses. So this is non-vascular, avascular plants, okay? Remember, they need to have liquid associated with them. They need to be closely associated with water, right? This is that first jump from the ocean to land, okay? So it's difficult for them to grow very large. They're usually very uh, small patches over very moist areas, okay? Whereas ferns or pterophyta are 
seedless avascular plants. Remember, ferns are the, uh, are the plants that have the swimming gametes still, right? So mosses and ferns do have gametes or um, sperm, te technically sperm cells that swim to the female. Okay, so both mosses and ferns uh, share that trait. Okay, where seedless and gymno seeded plants uh, and gymnosperms, right, are going to either have um, uh, gametes that are dispersed into the air. So remember, uh, large pines um, are going to be dispersing their their uh, uh, male gamete into the atmosphere as uh, pollen. Okay or you have plants that are gonna have bees or other types of arthropods or birds fertilizing uh, um, uh, those, those plants, okay? Okay, so conifer, this is a gymnosperm or naked seed plant. So they produce cones. So remember conifers, again, are gonna be dumping their, um, their gametes into the atmosphere. So remember, this is pollen. So when you see high pollen, high dander, uh, high allergens, and they include that pollen, that pollen is going to be a component of the conifer, right? It's going to be that male gamete that almost think of the, the plant as dumping its, its sperm out into the air. And that will irritate you because it's little tiny pieces of, of male gamete floating around trying to bump into another, uh, another plant, another tree to fertilize. Okay. And those cones is where you have that fertilization process. Okay. So that's that, um, that pollen will have to land inside of that, that little pocket um, for, the, uh, um, for the pollen to fertilize that female uh, gametocyte, okay? All right, angiosperm. This is a flowering plant which forms seeds inside a protective chamber called an ovary, right? Think of this um, as the fruit, right? Something that gets, for the flower gets fertilized and eventually returns to the fruit. Uh, we see this with oranges, right? Oranges will get fertilized. They have that white little flower. And then boom, that bud in the center of the flower will start growing and turn into that orange fruit. Okay. And that's going to essentially be the ovary. So angiosperms, the ovary is uh, the fruit. Okay. And they've developed cl in close relation to other organisms that eat fruit. Okay. Like we eat fruit. So we'll disperse, disperse the seeds in our feces typically. And other, other monkeys or the primates will do this as well. Okay. So they'll actually grab consume the fruit and then defecate those seeds. And this is uh, an evolutionary um, advantage for these plants to grow um, their ovum with the seeds inside, again, to disperse their seeds by another mechanical, uh, um, by mechanical means, okay? Whereas the conifers will just dump their seeds onto the ground. Um, maybe a squirrel or two will pick them up. But again, angiosperms especially have especially evolved with uh, insects and, and other mammals um, to, uh, to disperse their seeds, okay? So flower, again, is going to be an angiosperm, uh, a short shoot uh, with four sets of modified leaves, bearing structures that function in sexual reproduction, okay? So here's a nice little overview of plant diversity, right? Bi bryophytes, non-vascular, think of mosses. Um, remember the g male and uh, g gametophyte or gametocyte swims to the female, Okay, ferns, same thing, right? The male, the male um, uh, swims, the male component swims, the male gamete. Gymnosperms, uh, naked seed plants, think of pollen. Angiosperms, flowering plants, think of pollen, but that pollen is directed, right? Think of bees, uh, um, other types of, of, of bugs that can disperse the pollen to, to other, the other plants um, for fertilization. Also, some, some birds will do this as well, okay? So bryophytes, uh, they do have a waxy cuticle. Um, so this is, yeah, I just disregard the slide. Uh, we kind of already mentioned this. Liberated from aquatic living. So constant, constant exposure to liquid for survival and reproduction, right? The, they, the mosses definitely need liquid in order to mate, right? They have to have that liquid in order to have the male swim to the female, okay? So, so you do have a gametophyte, sporophyte, and a spore. So we talked a little bit about spores and sporophytes and gametophytes. There is the alternation of uh, life cycles, okay? So you do have a 2N and a 1N uh, uh, growth, okay? So the gametophyte, again, is going to be 1N, and this is going to be producing the gamete, so either a male and female gamete. Fertilization occurs, then you have a diploid plant, 
that produces a sporophyte, okay? The sporophyte can then uh, go through uh, meiosis and form spores. These spores, again, will produce a gametophyte, which will uh, then go into, um, go into that cycle and produce that sporophyte. Okay, so the female, the males will send to the females and then produce a thallus and then eventual sporophyte and then back and forth. Okay, so there's alternation of generations. Okay, so you do need to know that. Ferns, um, they are vascular, but think of them as very similar to uh, mosses other than that. Okay, so the, the characteristics of, of ferns is that we know that the males um, uh, gametophyte swims to the female. Okay, um, and, but they're vascular. Okay. Um, uh, carboniferous period, so it's between 360 and 300 million years ago. Uh, don't worry about this, just fossil fuels, talking about plants and coal, okay? Um, yeah, gymnosperms, right? We talk about pollen is the main characteristic here. Um, think of the redwoods, think of, of pine trees. Those are all going to be um, gymnosperms, okay? Right, pines. Um, so... Yeah. Don't worry about this. This is from, this should have been earlier, the slide. <laughs> All right, so terrestrial adaptation of seed plants. So pollen grain, pollination, ovule, germinate. This is, you need to know this, okay? So this is very important, especially with pollen, okay? Um, and the ovule, again, is gonna be found into, in those cones, okay? Those cones need to be fertilized. So here you have a cone. You have a tract here that has uh, the pollen granule falling in and fertilizing uh, the, the ovum, okay? So you have the spore wall, the egg inside, and then the spore. That pollen, again, will be um, breaking through that ovum in order to, to uh, or that ovule in order to fertilize, okay? So here you have uh, the, the pollen grain or the male gametophyte. Um, so the sperm nucleus, again, comes into contact with a female haploid uh, ovule, and then you have fertilization occurring, okay? And now you have a seed, right? All right, angiosperms, uh, you should be able to identify the components of a flower. If I show you this, you should be able to identify the ovule, uh, sepal, stigma, style, uh, and then the anther, and then the filament. These are going to, the anther and the filament, this is going to be housing the pollen, right? So the anther, pollen, st uh, stigma and style. So stigma is the sticky end where the pollen can be dumped off on. Um, and then another uh, uh, species of, of pollen can, can uh, come into contact here and then travel through the style to the ovule, okay? And this ovule will eventually become the fruit. So you should be able to uh, answer those questions based on the flower. Anther houses the male, male uh, pollen, the male gametophyte. Whereas the stigma, stigma and style are going to carry that pollen down to the ovule in order to make that fruit, okay? So here's various different flowers. You see the anther, um, all the various different anther right here, whereas the stigma and style probably the center, okay? And there's all different types of shapes, okay? All right. Um, we talked a little bit about dispersion and movement as well. So just know that... Um, yeah, these are important. Animals are important for, for angiosperms or, um, yeah, for the dispersal and pollination, okay? So fungi, these are not plants. So a few key characteristics of fungus, okay? They are not plants. They are heterotrophic, so they do not uh, perform photosynthesis, okay? Big, okay? Do not perform photosynthesis. They are heterotrophic, which means they need organic matter to break down. They're like us. They need to consume food in order to have nutrients and have energy, okay? Um, they are not like plants, all right? So sometimes I, students will get confused, even in my bio, biology, my microbiology class, right? They think, oh, it's green. That means it's a plant. It's photosynthetic. No, not at all. Um, there are organisms that they can, they can grow with algae in, in unison in, in a symbiotic relationship. This is called a lichen, but we're not talking about lichens. We're just talking about fungi, okay? So there's a few different things. Absorption, this is how they, this is a, a key characteristic of fungi. 
they are saprophytic, which means they dump out uh, digestive enzymes into their environment to absorb nutrients, okay? So it's a key component for fungus, right? They usually have very thin cells uh, um, formed in filaments called hyphae, okay? And they need to be able to dump uh, that their digestive enzymes out into the environment and slowly absorb. And sometimes you'll see this when you have uh, fruit, like rotten fruit or root fruit that does have a fungus. One of the key things, if you ever had an orange like this, right? You can literally, if you accidentally grab the orange, your finger punches through that orange um, into like soft tissue at that point, right? Um, and you get grossed out. You're like, what the heck? Well, think about it. That orange is solid throughout, but when it's associated with that fungus, this fungus is dumping digestive enzymes inside of that orange, right? So it makes sense that orange is being broken down already by this fungus and when you put when you grab that fruit you grab that orange or grab whatever the onion maybe and if the onion is is has a fungus it usually stinks really bad too um, but you grab it and your finger just goes directly into the fruit uh, or that vegetable um, and it's squishy right and that's that's the fungus's job it actually is able to dump these digestive enzymes out um, and absorb the nutrients as it's breaking down and they're able to break down plant matter very well too right um, yeah, so hyphae or hypha, hypha, one of many filaments making up the body of a fungus. Mycelium is a densely branched network of hyphae in a fungus. Mycelium, think of fuzzies, okay? Uh, when you think of hyphae, think of single filaments, okay? That make up the mycelium. So a lot of little filaments will make up the, the, the fuzzy fungus, okay? So hyphae, typically what you see is here in the mycelium. So a single branch, would be a hyphae, right? And the mycelium will make up the body of that, that fungus. And here is a re reproductive structure or fruiting body. Um, so typically what you'll see this, uh, in this type of thylum of fungus, we call it basidiomycota. Basidiomycota is a mushrooming uh, or the shroom producing uh, fungus, okay? Um, yeah, and so you'll see this and it'll disperse the spores underneath the gills. So if you ever looked at a, a mushroom, you flipped it over um, and you looked underneath, you see those gill slits, that's where all those spores will be produced. Okay, so that hyphae will grow up and, um, and dump the spores. Another interesting thing, I think I talked about a fairy ring before. Uh, this, there's a, a fungal growth in between all of, this fun, all of these mushrooms here. So all, all, of, this, um, uh, all of these mushrooms are uh, produced by one single fungus. And it's gonna be growing from here to here, all in this area um, in that grass, okay? Um, so just think of a network of fungal growth underneath all of that grass. And at the ends or the fringes of that growth, you do have the, the uh, mushroom production, okay? Or the spore forming um, uh, mycelium there, okay? All right. Chapter 17, we talked about origins of animal diversity. Uh, blastra, gastro, metamorphosis. I do need you to know this, okay? So there's different embryonic stages. Just go through this figure, okay? So remember a fertilized egg when a sperm meets the egg is a zygote. Um, during, after the formation of the zygote, you have mitosis occurring. Um, a blastula is the formation of the cells with a, a, an invagination or a, a crevice um, in the middle of the blastula. A gastrula is, uh, is showing the, the diversity of the cells um, and uh, changing of the cells. So you're going to have variation among those, those tissues. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, this is. I might ask you a couple of questions. I might show you an image actually for that one. It'd be easier to do that. All right. So early animals, we thought of periphera. We think of um, hydras, a fossil record, uh, radial symmetry versus bilateral symmetry. So you should be able to identify which organism is more, uh, uh, more complex, right? So we know that radial symmetry is less complex than bilateral symmetry, right? We are bilaterally symmetrical. We can cut ourselves in, into two, right? 
whereas radial symmetry, you can cut in multiple different planes and there, though that organism will all be the same, okay? No matter how you cut it, it'll be all be the same in, in halves, right? Where if you cut us in half, you can only cut us in one direction, right? So bilateral symmetry means more complexity. So you should understand that, that feature, okay? All right, body cavities. Um, no body cavity, think of a flatworm. Um, there's a, no true space. There's only cells uh, making up that flatworm. Whereas a body cavity in an earthworm, you do have a space, right? You do have a true body cavity with uh, fluid that's present inside, right? And we have multiple body cavities, okay? Um, we have a peritoneum, we have the endocardium, we have a visceral, uh, a, the visceral space for our lungs, right? We have multiple different body cavities. Um, major vertebral fine line. So sponges, right? We talked about perfora, um, filtering, the darians. Uh oh, did I upload the wrong one? I think I pulled the wrong one. Sorry. There we go. That was like 20 slides. I know I had to, I had to delete that one. Okay, um, let's see. Where are we at? No. All right, Nadarian. Okay, so Nadarians, think of the hydras, think of jellyfish. Um, so they have a gastrovascular cavity, which means that's a big, big trait of this, um, uh, a key feature of nadarians. Okay, they do have a single cavity for digestion and expulsion of food. Okay, um, so right, this is the mouth anus or that gastrovascular cavity. Right, so this is going to be all one opening. They do have tentacles. They do have stinging. Uh, um, spores pneumatocysts that can attach and, and inject venom um and that's how they capture their prey right but very simple the same thing with the hydras right there's a gastrovascular cavity here they have tentacles they're going to bring in or pull in food um so you see sea anemones corals and then of course the hydra which you see is fresh water uh sometimes so fresh water and salt water okay um Don't worry about this. Mollusks, uh, so they're soft bodied. Um, they have a radula, which is like a scraping surface. They have a mantle as well. Uh, so the outgrowth of, out, outgrowth of the body surface that drapes over the animal, the mantle produces a shell and forms a mantle cavity, right? So the mantle again is gonna be that, uh, uh, that shell housing tissue. You do have a radula for the mouth. Uh, think of um, snails uh, and and other simple organisms, but you do have um, nautilus, you do have um, octopus or octopi, and then you do have bivalves that also belong here. Okay, um, so you have mollusks, so the snails and slugs here, the bivalves, um, which include clams, moll uh, mussels, scallops, and oysters. And then you have cephalopods, which are going to include squids and octo octopi or octopuses. Okay, and these can be quite intelligent. Octopus uh, or octopi or octopuses, however they want to put the in the uh, plural. Uh, they're they're quite intelligent. So we've learned that recently that these organisms are are very intelligent. They can use camouflage. They can use tools. Right? You don't really see this, uh, uh, or you've never really seen this uh recent or we just seen this recently with those with those um with octopuses all right flatworms okay so they're on the same kind of branch as mollusks and annelid worms flatworms are typically um not uh not too developed okay so so you see nerve cord development you see uh, suckers you don't see true mouths yet so these do not have bone or, or dense structures. 
but you do see a lot of these worms um, having cephalization. So they are bilateral symmetry. They do have bilateral symmetry. You can only cut them in, in down the middle, okay? Um, but many of these uh, flatworms um, are associated with being uh, parasites, okay? So especially with um, tapeworms or uh, or planarian worms that can be that can be uh, uh, provide issues for plants. Here we have blood flukes, okay? So they, they kind of consume uh, blood off the individual's intestinal lining. Uh, so tapeworms, again, we talked about tapeworms uh, in salmon. You can ingest that uh, uh, infected salmon tissue, and then boom, now you have a long tapeworm hanging out in your gut, okay? Um, and again, tapeworms are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female sexual uh, reproduction. These are called proglottids. Um, and this is what you'll typically see when you have a tapeworm. You'll see little pouches in your stool, and it's actually these individual segments from that tapeworm that you're pooping out, okay? Um, and you're, you're passing out. Sometimes you'll pass the whole worm or the end of the whole worm, and then the person freaks out typically and doesn't know what's going on. Um, some people say that they think they, they have defecated out their intestine, and they'll go into the hospital and it turns out to be a tapeworm because uh, they're quite large. They can get quite big. So I think there was an individual in Fresno that ate some that was constantly eating salmon. He ended up getting a sea tapeworm, um, and those are those are kind of gross. Um, that freaked me out. I don't know. Annelids. Um, so we do have a complete digestive tract here. So that was that one worm that I showed you earlier uh, with the at, true body cavity. Okay, so you do have a complete digestive tract, a mouth, and then an anus, and then you do have true body cavity. Um, you do have a a, a, a simple heart. Uh, that can pump uh, um, simple blood throughout that body. Um, and only diversity. Yeah. So you're starting to get more diverse. You have Eurasian and sedentarian. So these typically move, these typically don't. Um, medical leeches, right, for sucking the blood out of uh, maybe a crushed hand or a crushed finger uh, to remove that pressure. Roundworms, uh, think of nematodes. These are going to be the more, um, these are typically parasites as well, just like the analyst or um, just like the, the, the flatworm, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and these, uh, these roundworms are going to be typically more, more issues uh, in people if you do have them, right? So um, Ascaris is, is a roundworm. So an Ascaris worm can cause very severe uh, parasitic infection, especially in children. So um, there have been a lot of case studies where um, they show children that are suffering greatly from Ascaris worm infection because they can overpopulate the body if unchecked. Uh, there's a really sad picture I saw in my medical microbiology course in college where it shows a, a 10 year old uh, girl's stomach or um, intestine that had ruptured from the amount of worms that we're living inside of it, right? So these worms can be quite nasty. And they're a little more developed uh, than uh, cestodes or those tapeworms, okay? So you do see uh, par parasitic roundworm and pork. This is why they tell you to cook your pork thoroughly. Um, uh, so it can be uh, cause trichinosis. So undercooked pork and uh, trichinella roundworms, um, so it can burrow into the uh, individual's intestine and then invade muscle tissue, okay? Uh, but they can also poke around in other areas. So they can actually perforate the bowel and go in different parts of the body, okay? Um, and cause encystments. So head of hookworms, they almost have like formed jaws. They have these, these hooks that can uh, dig uh, into the bottom of an individual's foot as well. Um, and they essentially go into the intestine and feed on blood, right? So they have that sucker and then they have that attachment point for the, the intestinal wall where they can dig into the, the body and then attach and then pull the blood out from the intestine, okay? And people can suffer severely. So they can become anemic. Uh, they can lose a lot of uh, nutrient. So these worms are typically nasty, right? These are not fun to have, especially because they move. Anytime you get an organism that large moving in the body, it's usually not good, okay? Uh, arthropods. Uh, bugs, right? Arachnids, crustaceans, millipedes, centipedes, insects. Uh, talk, I do need to know, do, do need you to know about the exoskeleton, right? So it's going to be a protective uh, 
a hard um, structure that also provides attachment points for the muscle. So movement is important. Okay. Um, echinoderms, these are going to be very primitive, bony, uh, um, pre, I guess, pre uh, um, chordate. So um, they're not true chordates, but they do have an ex, uh, endoskeleton and exoskeleton. So they have a, a, a bony um, internal structure, okay? Very similar to, to uh, chordates, okay? So this is why they're so closely related to chordates, echinoderms and chordates, okay? Where chordates are us, right? We do have uh, spinal cords, okay? So starfish, uh, sea urchins, um, sea cucumbers, sand dollars, these are all going to be uh, belonging to uh, echinoderms, okay? All right, so vertebrate, um, there's a few different chordates that we'll talk about. This is where I'll ask you probably a lot more of the questions. Um, so on the exam, the majority of the other questions will be before this, but starting here is where I'll ask you a lot of questions on the exam. So you do have the dorsal hollow nerve cord, brain, um, pharyngeal slit. So this is gonna be an early chordate, right? You have the tunicates, uh, lancelet, and vertebrate, right? So vertebrates are gonna be us, where you have the simple fish as the, as, um, the lancelet, right? So you have a tail, you have a mouth, very, very primitive, right? You really, it's bilateral, but barely, right? It's very simple. It's a very simple organism. Uh, tunicates are the sea squirt. So you'll see that this is uh, a chordate, but it's very, very, very primitive, okay? All right, so here you have hagfishes and lampreys, which we'll see in a minute. So cartilaginous fish, so this is gonna be sharks or rays. Um, we have lateral line symmetry, um, bony fish, and then you know, perculum are gonna be uh, found in bony fish. So. Um, Cartilage's fish need to be swimming, so they do not have a, a, an operculum. So um, sharks, what, right, they need to continuously swim forward. Uh, other types of bony fish, though, other than the sharks and the rays, uh, have the ability to sit, swim, st or stay stagnant, right? They can kind of float around and not have to worry about swimming in order to, to uh, aerate their gills or, or oxygenate their gills, right? They do have swim bladders. Um, uh, you have ray fin fish and then lobe fin fish. Oh, I thought I had more on, on, on fish. Okay, so well, I guess we can use this. But hackfish and lampreys, these are the ugly looking ones. I don't know if I showed you, but um, I think that, that lecture I did show you an image of, of the hackfish. You know, I'll just show you, it's fine. Hagfish and lampreys. Okay. So here we have the hagfish and the lamprey. So here we have a lamprey. Hagfish are a little grosser looking. They kind of have that that um, really interesting looking head. If you've ever seen, I know this is funny because my mom really enjoys uh, uh, tremors. So that tremors, the little snakes that come out of the ground, the, the, the heads of that. Um, what is it called? I think it's called a graboid, right? Though that those little tentacles are actually the the their their hagfish um, heads that they used, right? They use these as inspiration. I thought that was really interesting. Um, where you do see lamprey, lampreys are going to be a little more developed. You'll see them in the Great Lakes. They cause issues in the Great Lakes. They're trying to get rid of them. It's an invasive species. They can actually attach to fish and then cause. Um, Issues. So they have that jaw, but it's not a true bony jaw. Hagfish are really gross. They secrete slime um, and they can actually kill organisms that are trying to attack them by suffocating them with the slime. So I think, hang on, let me see. So I kind of like these fish. They're really interesting. So this is a slime that they can produce. So you'll see here. I don't know what's going on here, um, but. Oh, I think a truck fell over that had hagfish. Yeah, but it's really bad. It's like one hagfish can produce like six gallons of this stuff. And then what it is, is just a protein that gets dumped out into the, 
the liquid and then it solidifies and it, it can clog the gills of the hagfish. It's like a protein um, mixture. So it's, it's slime. These organisms are just, they look gross and they kind of, they freak people out. So uh, bony fish, oops, bony fish for an E in there. Uh, so an operculum is here, okay? Which is a shark does not have an operculum, okay? So you'll see shark, um, sharks do not have operculum. They have slits, okay? So they have these slits here. Oh, that's kind of sad. But they have these slits here that um, cannot open and close. Where an operculum, uh, the bony fish can open and close those flaps, right? Then that means that fish can stay stagnant in the water and doesn't have to swim constantly. Whereas these sharks, they require movement in order to breathe, in order to uh, respire or, or pass water over uh, the gills, okay? So hopefully that cleared that up. So I know I didn't have enough. I should have put more images here. I apologize for that. This uh, slides are getting too long, I guess. All right, amphibians. So frogs and salamanders, um, they have lungs, but they do need to be associated with some sort of liquid. They breathe through their skin as well, okay? So they do have lungs, but they can also breathe through their skin. Um, they're kind of the origin of, of tetrapods, or tetrapods are the origins of amphibians, right? So these are fish that can come onto land, and then they eventually developed into amphibians, okay? Um, yeah. So... Amphibians do have a three-chambered heart, so it's a little, it's not as diverse. They do not have as, as a diverse um, cardiovascular system, um, but uh, they're still getting there. So they're still able to breathe through their skin, and they still have, and they do have lungs, but they're kind of the precursor to early reptiles, okay? And then reptiles and amphibians have the best cardiovascular systems. They have the best um, uh, uh, lungs as well, okay? So do you know about the reptiles? Reptiles lay eggs. Uh, reptiles include birds as well, okay? Uh, Non-bird. Uh, well, there's ectotherms and endotherms. So ectotherms are non-bird reptiles. So think of uh, gators, lizards, snakes, right? And then birds are uh, endotherms, okay? So they're going to be um, reptiles that are that can regulate their, their body temperature, okay? All right, so ectotherms, again, need um, to gain heat in their environment. Endotherms make their own heat. We're endotherms, okay? So we produce our own body heat, right? We need to stay at a nice temperature to maintain homeostasis, okay? Um, so flight, then we get into mammals. Um, yeah, don't worry too much about mammals. We're gonna get into mammals right now in those next four slides, okay, chapter 22, all right, um, chapter 22, oh, it's already been 10, all right, so this will be the majority of the exam, okay, like I said, starting with uh, the diversity of mammals, so nutrition, um, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, be able to identify, talked about the different types, right, we are omnivores, we both uh, plant and uh, um, animals okay uh four stages of food processing we have ingestion digestion absorption and elimination so ingestion consuming and eating mastation digestion the mechanical breakdown which starts technically in the stomach but i would not call the stomach the true breakdown um or absorption does not occur in the stomach it breaks it starts breaking the food down the absorption starts in the duodenum essentially um and then follows through until it is eliminated in the colon, okay? All right, so uh, the cheese, this is kind of just showing you the breakdown, the absorption in the, in the small intestine, and then now you incorporate the protein from the cheese into your body, okay? We have protein, carbohydrate, and fat that can get broken down, right? Protein can get broken down to the amino acids, right? Hydrolytic enzymes, pepsin is a hydrolytic enzyme found in the gut, can break down uh, these polypeptide chains, okay? Carbohydrate, can, there's a hydrolytic enzyme called amylase that can break down a complex carbohydrate starch, right? This is starch, amylase breaks down starch. 
Um, and then the fat, we have light bases that can break down these triglycerides here, okay? Um, so we do not have a gastrovascular cavity. We do have a complete digestive tract, right? So comparing um, uh, this um, tenophore or the um, hydra to an annelid worm, we see a complete digestive tract just as we do, right? And remember the digestive tract is one complete tube that is continuous with the outside environment, okay? We have a mouth, salivary glands, and tongue, right? You should be able to identify this, right? You have tongue, you have salivary glands, uh, teeth for mastication. I don't need you to know the individual ones. This is not anatomy, so you don't need to worry about that. Pharynx is an upper respiratory tract area where you have the closing and opening of the epiglottis, right? So I do want you to be able to identify that your air, your tube for your air, uh, your epiglottis, when it closes, allows for the, the trachea um, to, uh, to pass air through, okay? So the trachea opening is in the front, okay? Behind that is going to be your esophagus, okay? So the trachea before the esophagus. So, the, um, uh, so remember that closing um, this epiglottis prevents the... Um, um, the food from going down your, the, your trachea. Okay. So, so you don't, it doesn't go down the wrong pipe essentially. Right. And the people have done that before where they try to breathe and swallow at the same time, or sometimes when you're drinking something, it goes down the wrong pipe because you're sucking on a straw or you're drinking too fast and you're breathing as well. Um, it goes down the wrong pipe. The wrong pipe is in front. Okay. The wrong pipe is right here. So I don't know if you've ever seen like uh, a movie where someone's like, Oh my God, he's choking. And they try to cut into his throat and they cut really superficially right here. That's technically kind of true. Well, you cut lower down here, but still um, the front pipe is always a windpipe or the trachea, okay? The trachea carries air to the lungs, okay? Whereas the esophagus is behind, okay? So do you know the anatomy of the esophagus and the trachea, okay? Peristalsis is a rhythmic waves of contraction of sumo muscles. Uh, so peristalsis propels food through the digestive tract and also enables many animals such as earthworms to crawl, okay? Typically, we think of peristalsis with uh, uh, our smooth muscle in our gut, okay? Um, so just minor contractions. We'll see this with our small intestine as well. So stomach, gastric juice, pepsin, chyme, uh, know the definitions. The small breakdown of the gastric juices from pepsin or uh, gastric juices with pepsin, right? We start the breakdown of proteins in the stomach. Also, the stomach is a very low pH, right? This controls for um, uh, pathogens, okay? It also can uh, kill pathogens and start breaking down some of those food molecules, okay? So stomach ailments, we think of GERD and ulcers. GERD is going to be like heartburn or the backflow of gastric juices. So sometimes this pyloric sphincter here will have issues uh, closing all the way. So sometimes the acid will spill up into the esophagus. As you see this especially with individuals who overeat, okay? And you might have come into this problem too, because I know I have. If I see a lot of food, maybe I'll overeat, and sometimes I'll be burping or feel the burn a little bit, and that could be because you overate in that juice. That pyloric sphincter is being stretched, stretched or pushed open because of the amount of food you have here. You might have drank in too much liquid, right? Um, and the, the, the liquid is spilling up into the esophagus, okay? Um, Especially when you're a kid, you overeat and you're like, oh no, I overeat and your stomach hurts. So they tell you not to jump in the pool for uh, an hour or so. Okay. Um, GERD, ulcers, helical back to pylori is gonna be the main source of those ulcers. Okay. About 70% of, of ulcers now are attributed to helical back to pylori. And this is a bacterium. Okay. Um, many times ulcers were thought to be caused by stress. Um, now we are looking at microorganisms as one of the key issues for causing ulcers, right? To causing stomach ailments. It's a bacteria present there, right? We're just kind of on the fringes of learning uh, what is really going on with the gut and why we have so many ailments. All right, so this is a bypass. Um, again, this is a gastric bypass surgery that'll help um, individuals who need um, help uh, that, that do overeat and are um, overweight and they want some, they need a, an extra, extra help aiding with their, the caloric intake. 
um, the gastric bypass can, can help with that. Um, uh, and this is, this is quite a difficult surgery. I'm, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of issues that can come from this, right? You can have issues with the, the, the attachment point of the stomach. You're also bypassing a huge portion of the small intestine. Okay. So this is the duodenum. This is a majority of where the, the, um, the breakdown and the absorption occurs. So you can miss a lot of nutrients here. So sometimes you'll see um, horror stories of individuals that do lose teeth or they lose bone density because they're not getting the amount of nutrients that they should. Okay. So, um, you know, these individuals that think long and hard about, about having a surgery like this, again, you know, some people do need it, right. Uh, there are other means of losing weight. Um, but again, it's very difficult and I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you that it's not as simple as like, I'm just going to lose a weight sometimes, you know, it, there's, there's a drive in our, or there's a mechanism in our brain that tells us that we need to consume food um, and it's food that's high in calories right? Um, and it's all around us. So um, for some individuals, this might be the only option, right? Or one of the only options. There's different types of, of surgeries. Uh, but this one is, is quite, quite hard on the body. Again, because you're not only limiting the calories, but you're also bypassing the, uh, the small intestine, which is a huge portion of the absorption, right? So you're going to be missing out your nutrients. And this is why sometimes you do see the loss of the teeth, okay? Um, so again, duodenum, that first portion of the small intestine, um, where you have, uh, the stomach being dumped, uh, or the, the where the food gets received from the stomach and you have the dumping of the hydrolytic enzymes from the pancreas, as well as the, um, the fat, uh, bile salts from, uh, the bile duct. Okay. So from the liver, okay. The gallbladder. Okay. So here showing the pancreatic juices the bile duct. Remember the pancreas also has the B cells that produce uh, insulin. Okay. Insulin triggers the body to pull in. Um, let us sneeze. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. I hope I didn't sneeze in the night. I think I sneezed in my, my mic. Apologize for that. Uh, thank you. you see <laughs> All right. So you do the innervation of the bile duct and the pancreas in the duodenum, right? Remember the pancreas is uh, an endocrine organ as well, secondary endocrine organ. So it does produce uh, insulin, okay? So gallbladder helps to just fats and remove, uh, can be removed with no ill effects. Uh, not true. There are people that get their gallbladder removed and they bite into a greasy burger and it is not good, okay? So think of this, the bile duct that gets removed, you don't have enough bile, right? You still have that tract to break down fats, but if that bile duct um, does not have enough bile to donate to the, the small intestine, you might not have enough to, to break down the fat or to make the fat soluble, okay? This can be an issue if you eat fatty foods, right? So you bite into a big juicy burger, you eat something fried, um, you don't have enough bile to take care of that fat, that fat is going to the colon. And when that, when that fat hits the colon, those organisms in the colon are going to love you for it and they're going to go crazy. So that overgrowth of microbes, that ingestion or breakdown of fat by those microbes, that person is definitely going to have some problems. Okay. And um, it's going to be very, very bad diarrhea and it's not, it's not good. Okay. Usually it's, and I will say this, I've worked in the clinical setting. I've dealt with in, interesting stools before. A fatty stool is probably the worst smelling stool you'll ever smell. It just, it's, I, I can equate it to like a very, very overweight cat that has been hit by a car and left out in the sun for like a week. And it just stinks really, really bad. So these people will definitely usually limit the amount of fat that they're consuming. Okay. Um, just because of that. I mean, it's, it's just awful and it's not fun. Okay. All right bile, liver, and gallbladder. These are all going to be associated again um, with uh, that duodenum. Okay. So kind of understand that. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, the inside or the um, GI tract being one single canal. Uh, this is a constant exposure to the outside world. So this is not a true body cavity. Okay. This is technically not a body cavity. This is uh, an internal uh, uh, this is your outside structure being exposed, but continuously being exposed, even though the tunnel is through your whole body. So you kind of need a, need a um, good explanation. You think of a donut, right? 
this is the donut, the inside the donut is inside the donut, but this hole is technically just a space, right? And this space is, is kind of giving uh, uh, like a nice example of what the GI tract is. It's an orifice. There's a lot of things going on. You don't want anything living in there that you don't want. But again, it's technically just a, a, an outside, um, it's still technically outside the body, right? Even your stomach and your GI tract and your colon is technically outside the body, okay? Right, we have the intestine and the in, uh, uh, absorption of various food particles in um, the uh, villi and the microvilli, okay? So this is surface area provided that will allow for, again, the absorption of, of food and different um, food particles. Okay, so human microbiome. Uh, we talked about Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Um, we want a very specific microflora associated with our gut. We need that in order to survive uh, appropriately. If we don't, we have dysbiosis or a inappropriate growth of organisms in our gut, we can have issues, okay? Um, we need those organisms in our gut. Uh, uh, and it's, it's a mutualistic symbiosis, right? So this means that we both benefit. The bacteria and us both benefit for having them there, okay? We want them there. Um, e. coli can produce cholestins, right? E. coli is a natural, normal flora in your gut. You want E. coli there. There are bad strains of E. coli, but the E. coli in your gut right now is fine. It should, it should be there, okay? And it protects you from other bad microorganisms that you might ingest, right? So we all like eating, you know, we all like consuming food. And in order to eat those foods that we like and, and consume the things that we like, we need to have those bacteria present there to protect us from other microorganisms, okay? Otherwise, we could have serious infections, right? So one of the big ones that I would see in the clinical setting is Clostridium difficile. And this occurs when you take too much antibiotics and you wipe out your normal flora, okay? I'll tell you right now that when I had my, my strep throat and I had to take the antibiotics, I completely blasted my, my, my gut, right? And you see this quite often. Someone might say, oh, my stomach's been upset for, for months after taking those antibiotics. And it's true, especially for long-term antibiotic chemotherapy. You can mess up your stomach. You can mess up, well, technically not your stomach, it's your gut, your GI tract, okay? So keep that in mind. You wanna maintain your normal microbiome and your normal flora. Okay, so large intestine, you have appendix, feces, uh, feces rectum, anus. You can go through this and learn the definitions or identify those, right? Here's your appendix, it kind of hangs out the side. Um, so your lower right, right quadrant, if you do have pain, severe pain there, um, then you know it's your appendix. Your upper left is going to be your spleen. So if someone punched you in the spleen and then ruptured, you start feeling pain. Uh, think of upper upper left is the spleen, lower right is appendix. Okay. Um, this is a nice little summary of everything. Food is fuel. Uh, think of cellular respiration, which we've gone over. Calories, running. Remember, um, the majority of our calories is taken up by our normal metabolic functioning. Okay. Running and and See, and exercising does very little to help you with, uh, it, does, it does help a considerable amount with, with especially if you work out and you actually um, damage the muscle tissue through um, activation. But in terms of the amount of calories you, you can burn working out, um, you need to do a lot, okay? So I know that sounds very, really bad. The cardio, probably about an hour of cardio would be sufficient uh, uh, for, I know it's a lot too, and people are like, what the heck, an hour of cardio, but in order to get the numbers that you really want for, um, for burning calories, um, you need a lot of activity, right? You need a very rigorous, uh, uh activity for, uh, uh, to burn those calories, right? Because the majority of the time you're not really, um, burning as much. And this is not for everybody. This is not true for everybody, right? There are bigger individuals that, um, you know, there, there could be a guy that's six, nine and he walks a mile and he burns, he pro probably burn a thousand calories doing that. Whereas I'm not going to burn as much because I'm not, I'm not huge like that. So um, there are different differences in body types and body structures, which will uh, determine how much calories you're burning. But still the majority of your calories that you burn are going to be from um, uh, your normal metabolic functionings, your brain. Okay. For, for instance, your brain functions, your your um your normal metabolic functioning okay uh so we talked about a little bit about essential nutrients um remember rice and beans you can get all the amino acids you need um 
vitamins. There's some water soluble and fat soluble vitamins. So um, kind of go through these. Remember, you can overdose on fat soluble vitamins. Okay. Uh, you can take too much vitamin D. Uh, malnutrition, a little bit about that. Eating disorders, obesity. All right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Chapter 23. Circulation and respiration, right? Circulatory system. Um, we have open and closed, right? So we talked about open is going to be like crabs or mollusks. They have open, they have one single heart that's pumping. And the, the uh, intersagittal fluid is going to be essentially the same as your blood, okay? Whereas blood in the closed circulatory system is kept away from the intersagittal fluid, okay? We talk about that. The, the, it's going to be a passing or an off-gassing of, of capillaries rather than the heart pumping intersagittal fluid, okay? Right? This is blood is separate, okay? Uh, artery vein capillaries should be able to define these single double circulatory system. Okay, single versus double. Remember, single pump heart pumps one way. Double, you have four chambers. Okay. or four uh, uh, areas of exit from that, that exit and entry from that heart. Okay, uh, pulmonary versus systemic. So this is uh, pulmonary, so the heart pumps to the lungs. Again, pulmonary, lung, pulmonary, right? We talked about um, the uh, pulmonary arteries are the only arteries that carry deoxygenated blood away, okay? Um, and then pulmonary veins are the only veins that carry oxygen in your blood back to the heart. Okay, you need to know that. I will ask you that question. I will ask you that question. Pulmonary arteries are the only ones that carry deoxygenated blood. The only arteries that carry deoxygenated blood. Pulmonary veins are the only veins that carry oxygenated blood. Okay, that will be on your exam. Free two point trip. Um, systemic circuit pumps everywhere else. Okay, so it receives from everywhere else. So your left ventricle and your right atrium, whereas your pulmonary circuit is going to be your uh, right ventricle and your left atrium, okay? Remember uh, 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 DVT or deep vein thrombosis, again, is going to be an issue for people that sit for long periods of time. So DVT, deep vein thrombosis or the clotting of your blood, right? Remember your veins are going to be very important for moving your blood throughout your body. Okay, you need to have the, the um, skeletal muscle aid in pumping the blood systemically, right? You need to know the difference between an atrium and a ventricle. You also need to know the blood flow. So go back to that lecture and I go through it like three or four times, okay? So you see the slide stop and watch the, the blood flow. And I will ask you the um, tricuspid and bicuspid or, or uh, tricuspid and mitral valve, okay? So I will ask you a couple of questions, okay? Right, you have your valves, and it will I'll, I'll ask you where the blood is going, okay? So you should go back and review that. Um, the lub dub diastolic and uh, uh, dis diastolic and systolic. Um, so diastolic is going to be that lower number, and systolic is going to be that number on top. Remember, systolic is going to be the high. So I'll just put like think one twenty. Uh, millimeters of mercury. Oh, and this is 80. The number, so it's millimeters of mercury. Oh, they also call mama huggers, but millimeters of mercury, because it sounds funny. Okay. So low and high. Okay. This is high systolic, right? This is when the, the active contraction occurs from the ventricles and disperses out the blood, right? Whereas the diastolic is going to be when the heart is not pumping that, that portion or that time frame where that heart is not pumping. Okay. Uh, I talked a little bit about pacemakers, right? That hearts need some extra help. If the rhythm is off, if you have fibrillation, you need the, the pumping or the aid with an, uh, with an electrical signal. Okay. Talked about capillaries um, and the off gassing, right? So this is where off gassing occurs to the intersagittal fluid to other cells, right? So here you have um, the capillary bed and you have the cells, this is going to be exchanging gas. Okay. So off gassing of CO2 from the intersagittal fluid or these cells and then oxygen uh, going over. 
Um, hypertension, think of um, 140 millimeter, 140 over 90 uh, is usually considered high. Again, hypertension. Again, this is showing off gas uh, of oxygen and then a dumping of CO2 into the, uh, the capillary beds, right? We talked about veins and um, skeletal muscle aiding in the, the uh, uh, pumping of the veins back to the heart or movement of blood from the veins back to the heart. We also talked about this valve or this flap, this opening, right? If this is damaged, this is, we can get a very close vein, okay? So this valve closed, right? It prevents the backflow, but if this is damaged, you have the pulling of blood and typically what you see is a very close vein, okay, or a collapsed vein, okay? Um, hemoglobin, blood, should know the contents. We'll talk about white cells later. Clotting, right, boom, boom. Atherosclerotic or pa uh, a blocked artery with uh, fat. We talked about a couple of different uh, mechanisms of repair. We talked about a, a shunt or a bypass, okay? So, um, <clears throat> or stent, sorry, I called it a shunt. A stent is gonna be used to insert into the, the artery to open it up. A vein or a bypass is gonna utilize a vein or I think I talked about the internal mammary uh, artery. Um, also can be used for a bypass in the heart. And then we talked a little bit about respiration <clears throat> or uh, the pulmonary system, okay? Um, hemoglobin off-casting. Carbon monoxide, not good, right? Carbon monoxide can bind to the hemoglobin and it won't let go. Whereas oxygen can bind and come off. He uh, uh, carbon monoxide will bind and then it will stay, therefore preventing oxygen from, from binding, okay? Um, so, yeah, talked about tidal volume and exhalation, inhalation. So inhalation, diaphragm contracts, exhalation, diaphragm relaxes, okay? All right, that should be good there. All right, so immune system, and I think this is where it gets a little confusing for a lot of people. Um, All right, so immune system, we have innate and adaptive, right? Um, essentially, we're trying to fight off a pathogen that's invading the body, okay? We have the lymphatic system that's closely um, correlated with the arteries and the veins. Um, you do have the innate immunity, okay? So this is going to be uh, the natural immunity that's always present in the body. We have the adaptive immunity again, which is gonna be the antibodies that are gonna be produced by your plasma cells or your B cells that will differentiate into plasma cells, okay? Um, external defenses, we have skin as a protection barrier, okay? This is a first line of defense, is your skin, okay? You also have the cilia or, or um, in the nasal cavity, again, primary layer defense. We talked about the, mu uh, the uh, mucociliary escalator. Again, this is gonna be the mucus in your lungs constantly gets moved up into the upper respiratory tract where you can spit it or swallow it, okay? Um, phag phagocytic cells can, can consume bacteria or fungi or other foreign invaders, natural killer cells, white blood cell that attacks cancer cells and infected body cells as part of the in internal innate defense, okay? Inflammatory response, remember inflammation can be good. We want inflammation sometimes. Again, it promotes the recruitment of phagocytes. This is called diapodesis or extravasation. This is a movement of your white cells from your blood to your tissues, okay? And then they will consume and then the skin will heal. Inflammation, again, you're gonna have a lot of uh, different cytokines or chemokines or these proteins that are dumped into the area uh, by these white cells. I can sneeze again. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So you have these different chemicals that are dumped by the white cells in order to recruit more white cells to the area. Again, it also promotes uh, inflammation and it also promotes the healing or the uh, cellular generation in that area, okay? The lymph node uh, does have the drainage of the, the lymph fluid, which is from the blood. And again, this is going to be 
the filling of this area to protect the body. It's going to be checking um, this fluid or checking this runoff from the blood in order to uh, look for pathogens and any organism, microorganism that might be present. Okay. Uh, we have a lymphocyte. Um, it's going to be present in the lymph, B cells, T cells, antigen is a molecule that can be um, that can in, incite a, a, a response from the immune system. B cells and T cells are in the adaptive immunity. Okay, B cells can differentiate and turn into plasma cells that can um, that can produce antibodies. T cells help modulate that. Okay. Um, so again, B cells bind to antigen. You have the activation of, with the T cell, um, and then you have the production of of the antibodies. Right? You have clonal selection. Um, the clonal selection will make more of these B cells, um, and then it'll turn into a plasma cell. Plasma cells are what's going to be secreting um, the antibodies. Okay. So this is these are actually plasma cells. These aren't technically B cells anymore. So B cells will be in the uh, lymph nodes or the lymph system, they will be touched with antigen and they will migrate to the bone marrow um, and then they'll start producing antibodies. You have some clone uh, memory B cells, which are gonna just be the memory B cells, but they're gonna be hanging out in the bone marrow and just stay there. This is why vaccines are so good, right? They can have these memory cells that are present there. If you get infected again with that microorganism or that pathogen, then you'll start producing, um, uh, you'll, you can actually access these clonal memory B cells and it'll be fine. Okay. Um, secondary immune response is typically faster. Uh, so just showing you how the uh, um, antibodies work, right? You have the different um, antigen uh, sites or these, these antibodies will bind to the antigen. Here you see the antibody binding to a virus, preventing the, preventing the virus from functioning properly. Here you have the antibody binding to bacteria, which will recruit the phagocytes to come over. Um, cytotoxic T cells will kill other cells or your own cells. Okay, this is through apoptosis, and this occurs when if the cell is infected with the virus. Okay. And secondary and primary responses. So this is first infection, and then if you get exposed to that same pathogen again, you have a secondary response, right? So you get the virus once. Uh, and then you get exposed again and you don't get sick because you have memory cells that can essentially uh, ramp up the antibody production very quickly. Um, allergen, right? We talked about allergic reactions. Here we have a tick, the Lone Star tick in Texas. No, it's not in Texas. It's, it's um, Southern, well, Southeast region. Well, it could be Texas, Southeastern. But uh, this tick bites you, you become... Um, uh, uh, allergic to meat, essentially, because of the saliva carries these, uh, the sugar that's found specifically in beef and, and I think another type of, of meat. And then um, your body amounts an immune response to that. Um, and it, that beef does have that similar sugar. So again, you will be, you'll have an allergic reaction when you eat beef. Um, and that usually goes away within three years, typically, from what I've seen, or from what I read. Um, yeah, pollen and uh, um, histamine, right? So you have uh, the mast cells that get activated by the pollen. The pollen will bind, boom, activate the, the, the mast cells, and then you'll have an allergic response. All right, we talked about EpiPins. We talked about EpiPins a little bit in the endocrine system, right? This is um, epinephrine. Um, this is going to be a uh, jumpstart your flight or fight response. Um, this will essentially stop your immune system from functioning for a second, because again, if you're going to fight, if you're ready to fight, um, you're not going to be worried about fighting off a of bacteria. Okay. So it's going to be boom. You're going to be ready to go. Okay. Autoimmune disease, immunodeficiency disease. By the way, this works if you're sick too. Um, <laughs> if that makes sense, uh, which I shouldn't probably actually not make. Autoimmune disease and immune deficiency disease. Think of HIV AIDS. Um, it's very bad around the world. America um, is pretty spoiled in terms of the amount of infectious diseases we have been able to control, right? We do have antiviral drugs or retro anti retroviral drugs that have been prescribed to the everyone or citizens of the United States. Um, 
where a lot of countries in the world uh, in the world do not have access to that. Okay, um, again, HIV is no longer a death sentence in the United States, but it is elsewhere. Okay, um, yeah, okay. So that's it for the review. Um, anybody have any questions? And thank you, uh, George and Lucia, for blessing me. No. All right. So remember, it's all multiple choice. So no free response. You have 50 multiple choice questions. Um, you got an hour and a half to do it. Uh, it's on chapters 16 through uh, 24. Okay. Um, And yeah, if you have any questions, email me. You'll have till Saturday night to complete the exam. Okay. Any questions? I have, I already went over chapter twenty one. George. <laughs> Is that a question or I don't know the dot, dot, dot. Oh, the tissues and organ. I'm so sorry. I didn't go over the 21. You're right. I'm thinking it was the same one. Um, yeah, here, we'll go over 21. Sorry. You're absolutely right. I didn't go over it. Good call. It's all very similar, so hang on. I didn't go over it. Yeah, you're right. I didn't go over it. Okay. So we have a structural hierarchy of cells. We have uh, the anatomy and physiology, right? Anatomy supports the physiology. Uh, tissues, right? So tissues are going to be big. The epithelium, this is what you need to learn in this chapter. So yeah, it's a big one. Um, so remember, cells make tissues. Tissues make organ systems or structures, right? So epithelium lines um, organs. Uh, and then we have other types of cells that are making up our organs. We have connective tissues that will um, allow us our tendons or um, ligaments to attach. Um, extracellular matrix, this is gonna be meshwork that surrounds animal cells consisting of web of proteins and polysaccharide fibers. Okay, some connective tissue and extracellular tissue can be denser than others. Okay, so we have loose connective tissue a fibrous and cartilage, okay? So this is gonna be the most widespread. Fibrous connected tissue is gonna be dense. This is gonna be tendons and ligaments, okay? So you can actually feel your Achilles tendon, right? Tendons are muscle to bone, ligaments are bone to bone. But here you, you can feel your tendon and how tight it is. You go back and you feel your Achilles tendon, okay? Um, loose connected tissue is kinda of gonna be that connected tissue under your the skin. Um, that is stretchy, you can move it. It'll be the, the connective tissue that you find surrounding your organs as well. Cartilage is in your joints, right? You can also have it in your ear, in your nose, okay? Bone is a type of connective tissue uh, consisting of living cells held in a rigid matrix of collagen, fibers embedded in calcium salt. There's different types of bone as well. There's spongy bone, there's compact bone. Adipose tissue is a technically a connective tissue um, and it's just a single cell with a huge vacuole of, of fat stored there, okay? Blood is also connective tissue. It's a matrix, right, that holds uh, uh, various components. So it'll have the serum, red cells, white cells, uh, plasma, all of the above, okay? So loose connective tissue, again, it's going to be on the surface layer or just under the surface of the skin. You have adipose tissue, which is uh, fat. We do have blood, right? Connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue. This is going to be the tendon um, or ligament, rather. Sorry. And then you do have the tendon. Where's the tendon at? Bone to bone. Tendon is bone to bone. Where's that? It's not there. So we don't have that. Okay. We do have um, uh, a ligament, and then we have um, or tendon, and then a ligament is bone to bone. Cartilage is going to be the synovial fluid surrounded by synovial fluid that uh, allows for the movement, right? Um, and then you have bone, uh, which is gonna be that compact bone. You have the ostea and the osteocytes here. Each of these canals, uh, Hervasian canals, are gonna have either a blood cell or a, um, a nerve going through it, okay? So bone 
um, does have good blood flow. Okay. That's why I always tell people it's better to break your bone than to snap a ligament or tendon or to have cartilage damage. Cartilage and, and the tendons, they do not get a lot of blood flow, whereas bone gets a lot of blood flow. So as long as you don't have like a serious break, usually it's just a hairline fracture. It's so much better to break your bone than to like get a very bad sprain of a knee or an ankle. Sometimes after a bad sprain, your, your joint is never the same. Again, because there's not a lot of blood flow to these tissues here. There's not a lot of blood flow to a tendon or a ligament or um, their cartilage, okay? Whereas bone, tons of blood flow. Each of these, these canals are going to have uh, 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 an innervation of blood, okay? So muscle tissue, skeletal tissue, right? Muscle tissue is going to be consistent with long muscle cells. They contract, right? Skeletal muscle, you can control it. Cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, you cannot control, okay? So make sure you make that distinction. Right. Um, so here we have uh, skeletal muscle, very organized. You should be able to identify this. You have heart muscle. The key to a heart muscle is they have these junctions, these gap junctions. Okay. In order for the cells to all talk together, this allows for this, the heart to contract evenly. Okay. So look, these, these little spaces, these little gap junctions are going to be very important for identifying muscle tissue okay? or heart muscle tissue. You should know that this is skeletal, it's organized. You should definitely know this is cardiac because of these gaps, these little spaces, these plates, okay, in between the cells. Smooth muscle just looks like connective tissue that's all kind of meshed together, okay? So involuntary muscles in your body, so um, cause the blood vessels to flush. These are smooth muscles. Again, your involuntary muscles like your stomach or uh, peristalsis or your GI tract, you cannot control that. Nervous tissue, tissue is made up of neurons and supportive cells. Uh, neuron, a nerve cell is the fundamental structure and functional unit of the nervous system. Uh, you, don't, um, you don't grow more neurons. Okay, what neurons you have are the neurons that you're going to keep, okay? And I mean, for now, they haven't discovered any neural forming unless there's some sort of manipulation of tissue, okay? Um, but neurons are, surround, are surrounding your body right? You do have tracts or canals in the nerves. Organ system. Uh, organ is a structure consisting of two or more tissues that coordinate or per to perform a specific function. Organ system is a group of organs that work together in performing vital bodily function. <clears throat> Human organ systems. We have a lot. Okay. We, we are going over them later though. We just talked about the endocrine system in this cardiovascular and the pulmonary systems, right? Exchanges with the external environment, um, open system versus a closed system. Open system is any system that exchanges chemicals and energy with its surrounding. All organisms are open systems, okay? Um, contact of simple organism with its environment. We have exchange, single cell, uh, the entire surface area of, uh, of a single cell organism, such as amoeba, contacts the environment, right? And it's important to have that gas exchange. Whereas we have the contact with our external environment with various organ systems, okay? We have the lung, the heart, pumps blood. We have the GI. All right. Mm. Homeostasis. All right, so this is a key, key feature to note. The steady state of body functioning, the tendency to maintain relative con constant conditions in the internal environment when the external environment changes. So maintaining your body temperature, maintaining your salt concentrations, maintaining your uh, food, right? Your uh, temperature, food, there's saline, there's dryness, you don't want to dry out, right? Um, intersagittal fluid is an accurate solution that surrounds body cells through which materials pass back and forth between, right? So we talked about intersagittal fluid and blood being able to exchange oxygenated gases. <sighs> so um, homeostasis, this is showing the cat that's able to maintain whether it's four degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Celsius, right? It's able to maintain a body temperature. Negative versus positive feedback loop, right? We talk about negative feedback loop. Um, if something changes, it goes back and stops that from functioning. Okay. 
we talked about endotherm versus ectotherm, right? We are uh, uh, ectotherms, right? Think of we're losing heat to the environment, whereas endotherms gain heat from their environment. So think of endo as pulling in, ecto is throwing out, okay? Fever is abnormal, increased temperature. You don't want a fever for too long. Um, it's a part of the immune system, right? We're changing our body temperature in order to make it uncomfortable for those microorganisms that are surviving in us. Osmoregulation, again, uh, controlling salt, okay? Um, animals gain water by eating. One of the cool animals that I like to bring up with osmoregulation are um, sea lions or seals, okay? They gain their water. They gain their liquid water from um, eating uh, fish, okay? They actually cannot drink the seawater. The seawater is much too salty, okay? So they will actually get their water from the consumption of fish. Excuse me. Uh, homeostasis in the urinary tract system. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but think of the urinary tract system as, as an organ that filters out the blood, okay? It's filtering out blood. Uh, with, um, and it also maintains salt. If you eat too much salt, um, you'll urinate more. You have the dissolved salts in your urine. Um, what else? If you're dehydrated, it will pull in the water and your urine will be much more concentrated. It'll use the salts um, in order to collect or reclaim that water. Um, yeah, there's a couple of different things with urine. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So important, the excretion of urine is a nitrogen-containing metabolic waste. The more protein you eat, you see a lot more nitri nitrogenous waste. waste. Um, one of the key things that um, people, or I usually tell people about the, the ur urinary tract system or the kidney, um, some individuals have the ability to break down um, asparagine um, or uh, aspartic acid from asparagus. And some people can smell that, right? So that's how you know, again, it's breaking down those proteins and dumping uh, um, the byproducts out in the urine and we secrete it as urea, okay? Um, and it's gonna be a component of urine. Again, that's why we call urine, urine, urea, okay? So filtration of the blood, reabsorption of water in the urine. So reclaiming as much water as possible if you're dehydrated. If you drink too much, of course, it's just gonna dump it out. It's gonna expel it, right? And this is why individuals on dialysis are, are told to limit the amount of water they're consuming, right? Because if you put too much water in your system, your kidneys are going to be running on over overload when your kidneys are already um, not doing so well, okay? Um, and yeah, okay, that is it. So sorry about that. I didn't realize I, I had skipped, oops, I had skipped um, 21. All right, so anything else, any questions? It was quite a long review, so I do apologize. So it's about an hour and a half. Um, all right, perfect, Lucia. All right, if not, again, I will have that quiz uploaded and then I'll have the exam after, um, you know, two days for that exam, okay? All multiple choice, okay? All multiple choice, no free response, so 50. Okay.